how did you get started on intuitive eating? I know you're in the Bay Area, and I've read a little bit about your website. Um, what's your journey in your words? So my dietitian introduced me to it. Um, I initially was in denial about everything in terms of having an eating disorder, but I knew I needed help just because I something was wrong. I was, I was miserable, I was hungry, and so I went to my physician and she recommended I see a dietitian. And I wanted to see someone who at least focused in the area like eating issues. And so I went to someone who is in um, Fremont in the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. And they actually have like an eating disorder person that like, very specific to this. And so I saw her and the first session, she gave me a bunch of information. And one thing was intuitive eating. And so I, I read the book and kind of went from there. Got you. That's cool that a, a Sometimes you hear dietitians are being kind of uninformed a little bit. Like I know sometimes I'll meet people who say their dietitian just gave them a plan to follow, but they followed a bunch of plans before. They didn't want to. They didn't want to try another plan. Um, so it's cool to hear that um, there's dietitians that are involved with uh, intuitive eating. Um, are you still in contact with your dietitian? How's that going? How's that relationship going? Or, or are you, has the intuitive eating journey kind of taken you on a different route? It's interesting because I thought it was a very much like a food issue, but it really wasn't, you know? And so the dietitian helped me in the sense that she guided me through intuitive eating in terms of like the principles, like the early principles, like when to eat in terms of when I'm hungry to identify cues and such. But it's really a, a therapy thing you know I really yeah. need therapy because it's not about the food it was about me and my you know my, my self-esteem and I had um I didn't know at the time I was in denial but you know some depression some anxiety and so I had to deal with that stuff and so I haven't met with my dietitian for a really long time um it was maybe a total of maybe 10 12 times but it was the therapy that I kept up with because that's what I really needed to be successful yeah, and your hangups, how did you start becoming more aware of them? I think that word denial is pretty powerful, pretty common. And the journey of undenial or whatever, facing yourself, how did that start to happen? Was it a sledgehammer in the face or kind of a gradual? Uh, yeah. Gradual. Um, it was gradual. It was something I initially said, you know, I have um, disordered eating, you know, I had eating issues. I used those phrases all the time. Uh -huh. And then I would slowly transition to, you know, I flirted with an eating disorder. I used those terms. And then I started saying eating disorder in my head, but I couldn't say it out loud until probably about six to eight months ago. <laughs> I just, I couldn't say it, even though I knew it was true. And it was on my, um, my statement from my therapist. It said unspecified eating disorder. It was there in black and white, but I was just like, no, 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 that's not me. <laughs> you know, it's for insurance purposes. It's, it's not true. But it was, it just was something that was hard for me to accept because it's such a big label. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can definitely resonate just, you know, social awkwardness. I can be a little socially awkward. Uh, and it's like, it's not fun to, you know, confront that and, and kind of own it, I guess, or be like, yeah, no, I don't fit in all the time. I get anxious. And, uh, yeah, man, it, it, it it's, it's, there's something scary about that or there's something like you know there's something fearful about admitting that those deeper um truths about yourself that are are not so pleasant right. um, and six months ago did, was there any was there any do you remember the day when you started talking about it and 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 uh or was it just kind of around six months ago um i said it to my husband first to see the way i feel most comfortable with and then I did a, a change on my website where I actually changed to, you know, I put eating disorder on it and I made a little video about it. It was not a big one, but it was just, you know, hey, I made this change and I've come to accept this. And I think it was just me wanting to help other people. And I knew that if I said eating disorder, I knew that more people would be able to identify with that because they probably are afraid to say it themselves. And so I figured if I said it and people could hear my experience, then they would get help too, perhaps. Yeah, definitely. What's been your experience, kind of timeline? So you saw the dietitian, like how many years ago and then six months ago, or, or how long ago was the dietitian when you first found out about it? 
Um, where are we at? So it'll be, wow, it's actually been a long time. It's been about four years, this oh. May, June, something like that, is in 2015. Um, and so the dietitian lasted for a few months total, and then the therapy said continued. Mm. And I became intuitive eating certified. Um, I would say it was 2017. It was a couple years ago. And then that's been my journey since then, you know, just kind of slowly becoming more intuitive as I've gone through. Gotcha. Them. But, um, yeah. It's still a work in progress. I mean, it's never ending, you know, yeah. I can't, you know, like my, my body's changing as I age. So I need to adjust how I eat. Like some, like some things don't agree with me and they did before. You know, like spicy foods I love, but I'm like, I can't do it as much, you know, oh. to adjust. Oh man, that, yeah. And you're growing too. Um, where did you grow when you first started your journey? You mentioned, uh, you started off with food, but then you were like, you started realizing that this wasn't about food. Um, there's so many different psychological aspects other than food. There's, oh man, I don't even know where to get started. I mean, from triggers to self-esteem or to whatever, what kind of resonated with you in the beginning of your journey where you're like, oh, that is helping me become happier in some way. And that, and that, you know, sometimes when we get that first glimpse of happiness, then we get really more committed, which sounds like that happened to you. You mm -hmm. got that first like glimpse and your life improved, I'm assuming. How did, how did you first start improving your life around intuitive eating or, or maybe that's not the right word, improving your life. Maybe your life's fine the way it is, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> One that stood out to me is my therapist. Um, she kind of laughed at me in a very, in a, not in a bad way, but I said to her one time, I'm like, I don't eat emotionally. What are you talking about? And she's like, yeah, you do. Well, she kind of chuckled at me because in my head, it was just like, no, I just don't eat. And so emotional eating was to me, you overeat. And I realized that I was under eating. I was restricting to deal with the emotions. I wanted to be in control. And so when I restricted, that was me being in control. So when she kind of chuckled at me, I was like, maybe I do emotionally eat. And that was a big revelation for me. And then I could deal with those emotions because it was kind of out there. And then it just, you know, therapy and took time. And then I'm like, oh, you know, I have these issues I need to work on. I'm a perfectionist. You know, I care what others think. I want to look a certain way because I care what others think. And dealing with that was hard, but I had to unpack all of those emotions first. Yeah. So the emotions that you were covering up, um, what were they? So um, I'm a school psychologist, and so I'm in the school system and I assess kids, and as with teachers and other people in the education system, it's a very stressful job. You're expected to do a lot in a short period of time, and so I felt that was very chaotic in my life, mm. and so I wanted to control something in my life because I felt that was out of control, and that came in the form of food. And, and so when I controlled my food, I felt calmer. Yeah, and, and not eating much or like having just a little bit and using willpower. And yeah, not, but then of course your body takes over and then you eat. But in terms yeah, of, yeah. right, yeah. I mean, that's just how it is. But also like with exercise, you know, being very rigid with it, saying I can control this. This is the schedule I have to exercise. And then stuff with work can just go crazy because I feel comfortable here with exercise and with the food. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. I feel like that's this is so common. Yeah. So so common. How did you know? You know, you said there were disorder. You were using the word disordered eating or eating disorder before therapy. So you had some awareness that you know eating disorder, eat disordered eating. You had some awareness that this wasn't maybe ideal. Um, how how did you know? Because a lot of people, I feel like they don't know. Yeah, um, I was like, books, <laughs> and I was looking in the psychology section because I'm a school psychologist, and my, I didn't see it, almost anorexic, mm. and um, it caught my eye just because in the back of my head I knew something was up. Sure. And so I flipped through it, and it kind of, I was like, okay, I see some things in here that I might want to look into a little bit more. I read it, and there was this... Um, like a survey in it and I did it and my score was really high suggesting I talk to a professional and I was like okay you know I'm so like humor myself and go and then it was like oh no no you actually have issues and um 
so that's how, that what really got me going was this book and then I, I like came out to my husband and you know it was it was very interesting just how it, it yeah it, it kind of came to a head and but it was the best thing that could have happened yeah um I really resonate with that when I first got into therapy years ago <laughs> um it was, it was, you know what, okay. It was actually at the suggestion of one of my teachers who I was in grad school for counseling back then. And she gave me a, a suggestion and a push and a, and a go to therapy, <laughs> push and a shove. And so I said, all right, I'm gonna go. I don't have any problems though. I'm just gonna go for uh, self-improvement and uh, you know, see what it's like. Just, you know, I'm, I'm doing, I'm getting my master's degree in counseling. I should probably just try it out. And then, uh, you know, just, oh, got some insights and oh wow that explains some of the problems I've been having and mm -hmm. yeah it's funny how um sometimes we get into this whole healing process just for curiosity right we can't quite admit we have a problem but we're we're curious yeah yeah I think we do that for a reason like we like subconsciously know that we need help but we're just like oh it's for curiosity or like you you label it something else because it's hard to admit out loud yeah it is there's there's something about the brain that just or whatever it keeps those it's like hard to keeps it hidden from you it keeps the, the the bad parts of you hidden and it's hard to see them yeah yeah and therapy itself or even mental illness mental health is looked down upon i mean it's less true upon, but it still is yeah there's that whole stigma yeah um there is that whole stigma and it's like I think that was probably going on in the back of my mind too. I don't, I don't want to officially, socially, you know, my status or whatever. I don't want to, I don't want that to go down. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that comes up when you hear other people on their intuitive eating journey, when you kind of work with people, maybe they're afraid to admit that, you know, they're out of control. Yeah, so I'll, um, I have my Facebook group and I, the Intuitive Eating Forum, and sometimes I'll say, you know, perhaps think about your relationship with, like, why you reacted that way. I'll just kind of suggest you look into this a little bit more, hmm. because people tend to not respond when you're like, you need therapy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I just want to suggest, you know, like, exploring a little bit deeper, because there's something there. And some people are like, you know, you're right. Others are just kind of oblivious there in denial too. And that's okay. Cause I was there. I get it. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a tough topic to broach. Um, mm -hmm. I know looking into like how you're using food. Um, so when you first started this whole journey too, and you started realizing that you were controlling food, you know, how were you like, kind of, how did, how did you realize you were controlling food? Cause sometimes when we, it's hard to spot, did you, like I've heard of an exercise where you say, okay, when, when was the last time I overate? What was I feeling right before I overate? And maybe it's anxiety or whatever. Um, did you do any sort of exercise that brought awareness that you were um, controlling food in like a too rigid way? That wasn't Not really. Um, it was just something that I, I recognized eventually. I started with Weight Watchers. So that's, it's a very, it's, you know, it's a plan, you know, you yeah. follow points and stuff. And so I knew there was that control in that part. It's just that it just spiraled, you know, in my head, I was a really, really good dieter, you know, but really it was just, you know, you develop an eating disorder. And so it wasn't something specific that got to me, but I just started with something structured. It just spiraled. It became uh, yeah. Like where you were thinking about points and what you were eating and not mm -hmm. eating and so forth yeah got you how did um it seemed like for you listening to your hunger it sounded like I might have picked that up wrong but it sounded like that was kind of something that came more readily to you like listening to your hunger cues you 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 maybe weren't aware of your hunger before but then once you got aware of that concept you were able to tune into your hunger um some other people that I'm talking to they kind of struggle listening to their hunger and, and kind of knowing what their hunger is saying. It's like a big muddled mess. And, and these concepts like physical and emotional eating, they are helpful. Um, but along the lines of hunger, how do you tap into hunger and, and understanding it? 
you know, that was one of the things my dietitian had me work on first, which is you need to eat. <laughs> I was underweight, not significantly so where I had to be hospitalized, but I was underweight. And so her thing was eat. And so I started with just like eating a mid-morning snack because for me, I had to play by the clock. You know, lunch is at this time, dinner is at this time. Are you hungry? Too bad. It's not dinner. Yeah. And so I know it's common for some people too. They won't eat past a certain time, that kind of thing. And um, once I realized, you know, I knew only like starving and I knew stuffed, I had to learn how to, you know, you don't go from like neutral to starving. You know, I'd like to learn those hundred cues that kind of came before that. And a lot of it was from the intuitive eating book. They have a list and things like, I think about food, you know, like when I start getting hungry, I start thinking about food like, oh, this sounds really good, you know, or it's starting to sound good, or I get lightheaded, or I can't concentrate as well. Just those subtler things that go beyond just like stomach pains, which is the most common. Yeah. So you started paying more attention to those subtle signs that are signs you're getting an uh, empty stomach, and then you would eat? How did that process go? You know, did, was there, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's, it sounds simple, but there's oftentimes a lot of confusion that comes up or did you have confusing moments where you're like it's not time to eat I know you talked about that or, or I just ate or I had a big breakfast why am I hungry now or, you know but you know any 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 confusion that came up and all that stuff yeah. yeah because I was resistant to the whole idea of eating in general because I didn't want to get fat I didn't want to put on any weight at all um I was like you know I'm hungry but I'm still going to wait, you know, like, but that was my thing at first. It was just like, I hear it, but I'm just not going to eat because I didn't want to. I wanted that control still. Oh. And then, like you said, sometimes I did think I just ate, you know, why am I hungry again? You know, not realizing I've been starving for the last, you know, five years and that I need to kind of, you know, not make up for lost time, but my body is like, you need to eat. You, it's been a famine for a really long time. Yeah. Or just, I didn't realize how much, um, or how little rather I was eating in, you know, each meal or each snack. I, I was used to having such a small portion that a normal sized portion was humongous in my mind. Yeah. How did you work with those thoughts? I mean, I know therapy is like a, you know, takes unfolds over time and it's kind of a messy or, or not a messy process, but you know, it, it's sometimes uh, hard to describe in clear steps, like how you did it. Right. But it seems like you became more aware of hunger, but then you realized you weren't eating, even though you were hungry. There was a fear of gaining weight. There was, you know, control. How did you start to like, kind of, you know, let go of that control and or deal with some of those uh, thoughts in your head? Or mm -hmm. how did, yeah, how did you start to like eat when you were hungry and, and not be ruled, when, <laughs> not be ruled by your mind, you know, or or whatever? Yeah. You know, it sounds so easy. It's just like, eat. I'm like, it's, it's more than the food. Um, really, I, um, my dietitian suggested that I just, for the, my mid-morning snacks, I was typically very, I would have like an early breakfast because I'd start work early and then lunch is like around 11.30 or 12. So I tended to get hungry, you know, like for a snack around 9.30 or 10, but I would always ignore that. So her thing was, you know, bring a small piece of fruit or something really small and just essentially practice eating, you know, get used to oh. the idea of eating when you're hungry. And oh. I did, you know, like once or twice a week, then it just, it built um, on every week, you know, so every week I just eat a little bit more. And eventually I ate like from Monday through Friday, I had a snack. And I remember like texting my husband, I'm like, oh, I had a snack every day this week. Yay. And he's like, that's huge. You haven't eaten a mid-morning snack for years. And it, it was just going through it. That's the part with intuitive eating that people it's hard because you have to just go through it. You know, yeah. it's not easy. It takes a long time, but no one can do it for you. And it's going to be different for everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, totally. Mm -hmm. That gradual process of, you know, it's like you're, what's it called? Um, like when you're getting into a cold pool, how you like get in very slowly. I mean, some people jump in, but uh you know, where you're like, all right, I'm going to have a snack. Okay, I'm going to go a little deeper. I'm going to have a snack. When you ate the snack, do you remember, like, how did, how did, how did you get the motivation to continue doing, like, eating that snack, trying it out? Like, did, did you notice that you, like, the, the stress of, of being rigid, like, that started to go away? Or 
uh, you know, how did you feel good about eating? I think this is so much about feeling good and yeah. you know, nourishing our body. I think, yeah, how did you find the motivation to continue with that snacking and, and develop it even further? Um, I paid attention to how I felt like I was, I was at work, so I was like, I mean, I want to concentrate a little bit more, you know? I'm not thinking about food during this meeting because uh, I actually have food in my belly. And so it really was just realizing that I felt better physically and mentally when I had even a small banana or like a piece of orange, you know, like I felt better. Mm. I mean, it's still hard, we know, there's still those voices oh, in my head that was like, hey, you know, you're eating, you know, yeah, that's, that banana's like 80 calories, you know? I'm like, it's okay, it's a banana. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. And so it, it was just, yeah, so there, there's that fight, but also I realized that I felt better, and I knew that was the point, because I felt miserable. I was yeah. awful when I was starving myself. So yeah. that change yeah. really helped me continue to eat. Yeah, um, and so much of the time too, there's uh, physical and emotional eating that's really hard to, you know, separate and, and so forth. Um, how how did you approach that? Um, yeah, how did you approach that? It, you know, like maybe sometimes people they'll they they're eating, and you mentioned this earlier. Yeah, they're eating and they're not hungry and they're not overeating. Maybe they're just eating a few snacks to stop being bored or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, was that a part of your journey? The emotional eating stuff, even if it's not overeating? Yeah, because the restriction was my emotional eating. Um, I use it to control food, so, or use it to control my emotions, you know, to feel calm. Uh, and so some people, they'll, they'll overeat, like for times of stress, for example, people sometimes will overeat because the food comforts them, you know. Whereas for me, I didn't eat because that comforted me in the sense that I felt in control, like I said that before. And so yeah. that was where it came in for me. Yeah, and then that, and then the flip side is where you're nervous or something, and, and then, the, then you're eating a little bit, grazing on things and, and trying to soothe yourself. Um, along with eating, so, so it seems like your journey is kind of like, you know, where you're not eating, so you give yourself permission to eat, right? And then that's, that's a, its own struggle. And then on the other hand, we have learning about emotional eating, which is kind of like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm feeling it up in my head, I'm trying to avoid an emotion. Mm -hmm. um how did the uh how do you work with emotional eating um i think it's just going through therapy and learning to identify emotions you know yeah. it's, really it's really hard like it's yeah it's like, people like i'm happy i'm sad but there's there's something like there's nuances and so i had to learn to identify you know or even physically i'm tired you know sometimes it's hard to identify what emotion or how i'm feeling physically or emotionally and then it's just how do I meet that? It could be with food because that's practical at the time, you know? Like sometimes I need energy because I'm tired. I need to eat. But also it's like, you know, I need to take a nap. I need to call a friend. I need to go for a walk. I, I had to learn to identify and then how to uh, address it in a way without food, if possible. Yeah, um, totally. And that, that process of identifying, you know, emotions is it's tough. It's, you know, if, if you didn't get attunement as a child, or at least speaking from my own experience, uh, just not getting really attuned in, in the emotional way. Otherwise, parents were good and all that. But emotionally, it was like, you know, kind of a blank slate. And so when I'm trying to, over the years, you know, trying to figure out how I'm feeling, it's, it's, ah, it's, <laughs> right? It's like, ah, it's like, it's so tough. Um, it is so tough to, to feel that, to, to learn what your body is saying to you. And um, how, how can someone think about getting reconnected to their emotions? If they're struggling with emotional eating and they, they're hearing this and they, they're like, oh, that's my problem. Oh, that's the solution. I gotta, I gotta identify my needs and my emotions. Um, and then probably in the back of their head, they're like, crap, it's going to take years. <laughs> How, any helpful pointers or ways to think about reconnecting to your emotions and learning what they're saying? Um, um, one thing is, is that emotions are temporary. 
and yeah. you know you never are permanently happy or permanently sad and so sometimes you just, if you sit through them they will fade you know or yeah. they may simplify a bit but they will always fade and i yeah. think that's something important to realize is that if you're feeling stressed or if you're feeling sad or whatever it's going to pass it yeah. may not help me in the moment but it will yeah totally it's like we're feeling yeah and then the other thing I, I would say is that um, it's okay to emotionally eat at first. Don't expect to go from like emotional eating to not, you know, yeah. just gradually implement strategies, you know, and it'll, it'll take time and it's okay yeah. if you only eat 80% of the time and then it's 60% of the time. Just go slowly. It's not going to be an easy change. You didn't get to that point overnight. You won't undo that overnight either. Yeah. And oftentimes when people start to, start to like, so if they, if their instinct is to automatically eat food when they're feeling negative mm -hmm. and then they start to break that instinct. So it's, they're pausing a little bit when saying, Oh, wait a minute. Like this is, this is my coping mechanism. Start to feel those emotions a bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, Oh crap. I'm, I really am anxious right now. Um, yeah. Was that your experience as well? Yeah. For me, the unknown is really hard. The unknown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah whether it's work or personal life or whatever, just the unknown is hard for me to sit with, you know, to, I would think of the what ifs. And so yeah, the anxiety group, and I was just talking about, you know, like, can you change it? For example, it's like, well, no, you know, no matter how much I worry, I can't have a solution right now. So a lot of it was just sitting with it and using my rational mind to, to work through that and say, you know, this doesn't really help to do what I'm doing. I need to find another avenue for it. Yeah. So you were able to work with your rational mind. Sometimes that mind can, you know, mm -hmm. you know, that what if stuff, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, um, how, how'd you get control or maybe that's not the right question, but instead of being like hijacked by your thinking mind into spinning off worst case scenarios, it seems like you're able to take a little bit more rational control and being like, Hey, is this, it's going to pass. I, I think that's a great mindset. You know, this, this motion is going to pass. Um, were there any other ways you like were able to relate to that that uh, intense feeling that was that you were covering up with food? Mm -hmm. um, that rational mind thing is interesting, just because it didn't come easily. You know, like of course it, it was there, which is something that I had to essentially stop my negative or anxious thoughts. You know, like what if, what if, what if, and I would say, you know, something, whatever happens, happens. You know, like I can't really. I can't change the future. I just can't change the past. You know, or you can't really anticipate it to the point where you have total control over it. And letting go of that control is hard. Yeah. It's, it's, that's how reality is. You know, you don't know the future. And so I could, what if myself to death and it'll be what it'll be. And so I just had to realize, you know, let's focus on the moment. You can't do anything about it. Just yeah. do what you can do in the moment. Yeah. It's funny that fear of the unknown, like when you said it, I was like, oh my God, that's so true. Um, yeah, the unknown is totally, like I just resonate with that. It's, you know, I guess it's obvious now that you say it, like, oh yeah, the unknown is terrifying. I, I like order, I like control. Uh, mm -hmm. and, yeah, it can be terrifying. Like, um, like just the other day, I was having like a shame attack, right? So mm -hmm. I think it was like this projection, like a subconscious projection, like, I'm going to feel bad forever. Like I knew intellectually, of course, that, oh, okay, this emotional pass, blah, blah, blah. But I think like in my body, it was, it was a projection. Like, um, uh, like this, this bad feeling is you're, you're going to stay this forever. So I, I did, I was emotionally eating a little bit. You know, I try to like, what I give advice to people, what I try to say to myself is like, if you're going to emotionally eat or, or cover up, like enjoy it, right? Like enjoy the food and enjoy the food. Like, it's okay to emotionally eat. Like if you're working with the emotion, you're, you're sitting with it, you're, you know, you're, you're trying to work with it logically and emotionally and you're breathing and you're, you're not going right away. And then when you go to get food, it's like, you know, um, was there any, like sometimes when people eat, eat on this journey, they have a lot of remorse. And that's something that I'm fortunate where I, I, I've, I don't know. I, I'm fortunate in that I don't have less remorse or whatever. Sometimes there's a lot of guilt. Was there any, was that an aspect of your journey? Or is that, or how was that an aspect of your journey? Um, 
because Weight Watchers was very much, you know, like these are your maximum points for the day. That was a, a rule. And so I became really rule based. And it's, you know, you either, you either follow it or you don't. It's like yeah. black and white. And so when I didn't follow it, there was that guilt. And one thing I put this on my blog, it's like, you know, I didn't club a baby seal. I ain't burned out an orphanage. It's okay. <laughs> you know, break a rule. Like nothing is going to happen. That's a big, you know, if I exercise for 45 minutes instead of an hour, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay to not be as strict and, and so forth. It's crazy how like somehow, you know, I know from the culture can be, give healthier die messages where it's like, Oh yeah, calories are associated with uh, increased risk of death. <laughs> like, you know, so it's easy to kind of internalize that like extreme mentality, you know. Yeah. And also with that, um, even though orthorexia isn't in the the DSM, you know, the the clinical book that people have. I don't know if you know what that is. You probably do, being a counselor. The, the DSM. I've heard of it. I've heard of it. What's yes, it? the <laughs> Diagnostic Statistical Manual. So oh yeah, 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 involved. yeah. Yeah, so this is where you get the, the diagnoses for everything. For or like orthomexia or what? Orthorexia. Orthorexia. So that one's not in there, but that's one that I, I'm suspecting will be soon. It's the, the eating disorder that has to do with healthy eating, you know? Oh. You have to eat non processed foods, you have to eat organic, that kind of thing, where that's the obsession. It's very specific. And that I think it catches people because they're like, oh, I want to eat healthy. Yeah. So let me make sure I eat only whole foods, and et cetera. But it can, can be very obsessive. Same with anorexia and all the other ones, too. Yeah. Oh, speaking of, I want to come back to that because that's fascinating. But I had this back of the head when you said, hey, you know, I'm going through this intuitive eating certificate course. And, and they're saying when you work with anorexics, which I have yet to do. I've worked with other people, but never someone anorexic. Mm -hmm. uh, there's oftentimes they're saying in the beginning, you don't the anorexic has such a distorted view of their hunger and, and so forth that, that sometimes, you, you know, uh, it's better to start with like a plan or, or something like that. Um, yeah, so like if someone has a really distorted hunger, I mean like really anorexic, someone's anorexic and not almost anorexic, but yeah. in the throes and they're, you know, getting out of diet mentality, and they're starting to reconnect with their hunger. Do you have any wisdom you could share about how to reconnect to body? Um, I know there's that meal, giving them a meal plan or, or you know, eating time schedule can be helpful. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, can you hear my cat at the door? Is that your cat? <laughs> I don't want to let come in and be on the podcast too? I'd love to have them. I grew up with 13 cats, not all at once, but I love cats. It's just one of those things where, like, it was distracting. I don't want to. <laughs> um, yeah, so in terms of anorexics, uh, yeah. We're just yeah, really I'm, having a hard time connecting with hunger. Yeah, it makes total sense. I, I wasn't at that point, but I was, I was close. Yeah. And so hunger is hard to identify, you know, and it, it, I believe it would have helped me if I had gotten to the point where I was anorexic to have something where it's just like, you need to eat, you know because it's, it can be a very deadly thing. You know, like you, you need food for your heart, all your organs. And so like, it's just more just like making sure that you're healthy enough to survive than worry about intuitive eating. Yeah. Yeah. If someone is healthy enough to survive and they're trying to reconnect with hunger and it's, you know, they're muddling through it, any, any sort of thoughts there? I mean, if they're trying to reconnect and yeah, they got really. It's really they're really having a hard time connecting to their hunger cues. Like, you know, yeah. they try to pay attention to their body. They might even put their hands on their stomach and just say, "Yeah, I feel my hands, but I just don't feel anything else down there." Like, you know, it's it's like, yeah, I can feel my yeah, and they're like, I can, you know, now that you're saying it, but they're it's just like the the neural connections down to their gut are just like mm -hmm. almost not there. Yeah, that's very true. The, the authors um, mention two things. One is that when you start out and if you've restricted, sometimes it may be a good idea to be on a, not a plan, but a, like a flexible plan where it's like eat maybe every four to five hours just because your body needs fuel typically that often. Yeah. And so it might be a good idea because if you don't hear the hunger, you still need to fuel your body even though you don't recognize that you need to fuel your body. 
Um, and so that's something I would say, you know, talk to a dietitian about or something, because that's individual. Yeah. That's a good idea in the sense that your body does need constant fuel, you know, throughout the day. Yeah, I've totally heard that. Like five hours is the upper limit where you got to, you know, you got to eat if, um, you know, you're having a hard time. Five hours, like keep the timer going or, or like, you know, yeah. watch out. Don't, don't let too much time go by. But back right. to um, orth orthorexia. Orthorexia. Yeah, that one's that one's tough. It's, it has the same kind of obsession symptom, but it's like, oh, I'm skinny and like, you know, healthy eating is good. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of times this fear when I present intuitive eating. There's this fear of unhealthy eating. It's like the, you know, we assume because it's intuitive and we're you know, just having that conversation that, hey, you know, we're going to jump off the deep end and, and uh, be totally unhealthy and blah, blah, blah. Like, um, well, what's that been like for you? Um, and, and how do you work with people or help people think about uh, healthy eating and quote unquote healthy eating? Right. Um, it's one of the labels that it's, it's been demonized in the sense that there's nothing wrong with the word healthy, but people associate it with, you know, being good you know, yeah. and then I eat healthy. And so um, I just, when you start intuitive eating, you're going to eat what we would consider unhealthy food because that's what you've been restricting. Your body's going to want to have what yeah. it didn't have in the past. And so people freak out about that, and rightfully so, because their rules have been to eat healthy. And eventually your body will tell you what it needs because your body will want variety in time. It'll say, you know, that apple looks really good. Or I really want, you know, a peanut butter sandwich as opposed to, you know, cookies and ice cream. And your body will request that with cravings. But at first it's just more of a the psychological deprivation you have to deal with and just eat those foods that you deprived yourself of in the past. But then your body will eventually, I said, want variety. It'll want balance. Yeah. When you say eventually, too, I know it's a spectrum, but any range? Yeah, that's, everyone asks that question. <laughs> um, that's why it's, it's a logical question, and it makes sense. Um, someone on the Intuitive Eating Forum said, for every year of dieting, no, is that right? Yeah, for every year of dieting, give it like a month. Oh. So, I mean, if you've been dying for 10 years, give it about 10 months, you know, ballpark. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a, good way to look at it i mean not maybe all the way to become an intuitive eater but to really get a handle on it mm. and that can be discouraging for some people because they want like with dieting a now 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 kind of result and it it's not a now 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 result at all yeah 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 absolutely and and working with um incorporating those those foods uh unconditional foods um you know i know people can do gradual um uh, and um is that what you'd recommend? Going kind of gradual, you know, like sometime, yeah, like going gradual. Um, or, or how would, you know, I guess, I guess hearing, you know, 10 months for someone might be like, or, you know, if they've been dieting for 10 years, 10 months, like 10 months, I'm going to eat just nothing but donuts. You know, that's the, the, the what if scenario, which usually isn't true, but if, you know, what, so as in 10 months, it's not like they're eating donuts that whole time. They're, it's only when they want it, sort of, and um, it's not like every single meal is a donut, right? No, but some people do that for the first, you know, if, if a donut's their thing, they may eat a donut really for every meal for maybe a week, and then your oh. body's like, oh, that's all, you know, I want something else, <laughs> and that really yeah. doesn't happen. One thing that catches people is that they say, I've been doing intuitive eating for a year and a half, and I'm still eating these foods, and I'm like, yeah. have you really given yourself true permission to eat? Because sometimes uh -huh. it's like that fake permission, you know, uh -huh. and uh, they'll, uh -huh. they'll restrict a little bit. Like they'll say, you know, I can only have one donut, you know, not that unconditional. And so that'll hang people up sometimes too, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, it absolutely does. Yeah. Um, it does. Um, I sometimes, some confusion that comes up for me when I'm trying to um, help people in this is like, you know, oftentimes when people, in my experience, when they when they do start allowing some more flexibility into their diet, it's just this enormous weight off their shoulders. Like, oh, I can, you know, have that X, Y, and Z, have that donut, um, and it's okay. Like, it's okay, you know. Um, 
but that but it's not quite unconditional right you know um and and um that 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 unconditional aspect um you know how to how how, how can we think about how can people on the intuitive eating journey think about you know going from how to, how to just make it un, totally 100 percent unconditional not just like you know because yeah. yeah gradual you know gradual you know if unconditional is infinity right mm -hmm. if you're going gradual it's going to take you an, an infinite long time to to do yeah. it you got to take that leap of faith i and you asked about um you know you mentioned gradualness and so for me and for i think a lot of people going slow is the best route yeah um some people they, they can't just rip off the bandit and they're fine and more power to you that's great yeah, yeah. Um, but i did like pretty much one food at a time mm. because i would have been completely overwhelmed if i had you know like all these foods i had to had to you know work through at once and so you know i worked through potato chips you know mm. and then ice cream and um mm. once i realized as i got through like those or don't so those basic foods that were really restricted that yeah, it's okay if they're unconditional. And I, actually, at some point, I found I didn't like some of them because I was eating them when I wanted to and I was paying attention. And I was like, you know something? I don't really like this because it's too salty or it's too rich or it's too sweet, whatever. And it, it was very interesting. But gradual works for a lot of people in general for the intuitive eating. Yeah. Um, and how was your process around working with one food at a time? I love it. I've heard various things like like you, i've just heard so many different ways and um from you know where you, let's say potato chips so you can where you have it accessible so it's in your car so basically if you have a craving you you don't have to wait six hours to go get potato chips in your car or it's in your at your home so it's accessible you can you can actually indulge that craving on the moment in the moment um you know i've heard other things accessible but not visual so it's like in the cupboard if you want it it's there um, I've heard other things too, where it's like, I don't feel comfortable with this at home, mm -hmm. but I'm going to allow myself to treat myself at a nice restaurant after work or, or mm -hmm. something like that. How, what was the, like the nitty gritty of, um, the nitty gritty of, um, working with those foods one by one? Yeah. The idea of, you know, I guess still restricting at home and having it available in other parts that can be a transition period for some people you know and that's okay some people if that's your baby step that's your baby step you know and then eventually it can be all times it can be available um, but the nitty-gritty part for me was really just having it kind of everywhere I I loved nuts <laughs> and it was one of those things that it was, it was crunchy and I, I would overeat them partially because I was a vegetarian and so I needed the protein because I was under eating that was like my protein and I felt guilty about eating them because in my head they're full of fat, you know, and they're high calories, you know, that kind of thing. And so I just, I bought pounds of it. <laughs> and it was just, it was there in my house. I could not eat it in one sitting because there was just too much. But it made me realize that I, it's there whenever I want. And I even ate to the point, sometimes where I didn't feel well. But then I learned that, okay, so that's too much. And my body's telling me to slow down. And I learned from that experience and I could adjust for next time and not eat as much because I knew I wouldn't feel really that good physically if I continued to eat and it helped me learn. Yeah, absolutely. Totally hear you. Mm -hmm. And and working with foods one by one. So let's say you, you get nuts, you get a lot of them at your house, so it's available and you know, and then so you eat nuts. What happens if you're like let's say you're 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 on you're working with nuts, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got a craving for like I I don't know, like chips whatever potato chips so you're working with that then you got a craving for chips yeah. you know or do you have all these like do you have like a huge pantry of all the craving foods or or uh or is because that's not really one by one or how you know yeah you know when that element comes in how do you deal with that yeah. um and some people do have the whole you know pantry full of things okay, that, gotcha. that works for them that's fine um for me i i had a focus like even for intuitive eating in general i focused on one principle I didn't ignore the other ones, I just had a focus. And so my focus was initially nuts. Oh. But it, it, I mean, I wouldn't like stop applying what I learned to other foods, it was just I had a focus. And then once I made peace with that, I moved on to other things like oh. the and stuff. And so um, if I wanted potato chips, I would eat them, but I would, you know, if I ate too much, I didn't feel well with the nuts, I can apply that knowledge to the potato chips. You know, when should I stop or should I continue or not? It just 
Yeah. That make sense? Yeah, I, I think that's an important message for people um, in the sense that, you know, because oftentimes if you're that ortho, ortho, ah, <laughs> orthodex. That's a new word for life. Yeah, new words, right? Um, ortho, oh, wait, ortho on. it sounded like dyslexia, ortholexia. Orthorexia. Orthorexia. Ortho yeah. Yeah, or even just, you know, the normal person who's been on a diet. Um, they might have like a huge list of forbidden foods and they're thinking, I got to go through that whole list. And it's like, from what I've seen, it kind of worked. It's like, no, you kind of, you know, you sort of get the hang of it, sort of. Um, you don't need to go through the whole list. Um, mm -hmm. Like what you said, if you, you know, you overeat on nuts, you kind of make a mental note that it feel well. Um, um, when you overate, was there any guilt? Yeah. Oh, there was. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it still went against my rules from before because the rules I had to work on also. Yeah. To, to loosen them. And so when I over, well, actually, I didn't really overeat. That was the thing. In my head, yeah. I was overeating because yeah. I, I had a limit in my mind of what was considered okay. And so, um, like, I, I never binged or anything, but it, oh. it was overeating in my head. And it, it was to a certain degree. But the guilt was there because, like I said, I had that rule. And working through the food rules is its own challenge in itself. Yeah. Saying that, you know, like carrots yeah. and carrot cake, they're both food. You know, one's not good, one's not bad. They're food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I'm feeling... Like I'm a sponge full of knowledge that I'm, and I'm, you know, when you fill up a sponge with water and it, and then no more water can like go in the sponge because it's already filled up with water. I'm starting to feel like, man, I've absorbed so much information that, um, uh, like I'm, you know, I'm going to digest it all and all that stuff. Um, why don't we wrap up soonish? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'd like to just ask uh, the, the question, like what's been your biggest, I always say this, What's been your biggest insight, or as I say, enlightenment, how I use the word enlightenment, biggest insight, paradigm shift, uh, you know, biggest moment of, you know, the light bulb moment going off. Mm -hmm. um, what's been that for you? Um, nothing specifically. There hasn't been one thing. One was the baby steps. I think that was huge because I wanted to get everything done right away and it doesn't work that way, at least for me. Baby steps was a a game changer because I realized that I need to go slow because that works for me and my personality. Um, the idea of in, being intuitive actually permeates my life a little bit more now. Like, oh, I, I need to, you know, I do use intuitiveness when I think about like exercise and about sleep and like what I want to watch on TV. You know, I mean, just what am I in the mood for? You know, it's what feels good. I mean, of course, you have to be practical. You know, I can't, you know, like nap in the middle of a work day, but you know that idea is I'm intuitive in other areas and um it sounds easy but it's actually a challenge and that was something that when I read the intuitive eating book I'm like this is gonna be easy you know because as if on paper it does sound easy but it's it can be challenging yeah absolutely um what have you got going on in your life where can people reach you I know you just put up a, a video on your blog which was a great video mm -hmm. thank you by the way it was <laughs> Yeah, um, yes, I'm on YouTube, and I have my uh, website, mymindmybody.net, and those are the two main places. I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Twitter, and you can, you know, post that if you want in the description box or whatever. Um, those are the main areas I'm at. Got you. Yeah. Cool. Well, everyone, 